Hi, welcome to Olivet Baptist Church. I hope you acclimate and learn to enjoy worshiping at home. I can see some of you are still in your pajamas and some of you have your coffee. Oh, I see someone on an exercise bike. Praise God, good for you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for your love for each one of us. Lord, we pray during this difficult time that you would touch each heart, that you would draw us close to you, Lord, that we would be a prayer and that we would activate our faith to trust you. Lord, we realize that some uh, have a high degree of vulnerability to the virus, and we just pray you protect them and watch over them. We realize that others, Lord, have been sent home from work, and we know that all the kids are home from school, and we just pray that you give the parents uh, some patience in dealing with them and helping them and working out of the house. Bless our church, continue to be with our renovation for our sanctuary, and Lord, we just pray that as a church family, you would bind us in the unity and harmony and love of the Holy Spirit. And I pray a special prayer today for my mom, Lord. You might put your hand upon her and heal her and bless her. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone once said that timing is everything. And isn't it interesting that we live in very troublesome times? I know that for some of us, when we get sick or we have a an operation and we're in the hospital, even though it's a difficult situation and a difficult thing to deal with, very often the testimony I hear from people is that they had nothing else to do, so they spent the time in prayer and they drew close to God. And that's my prayer for all of you uh, during this time of, quote, social distancing, a new term that we've all embraced. So I want to talk to you about time. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, in verses 3 through 5, God creates something very interesting on the first day of creation. He says, let there be light. And for most people, they believe light was the creation. However, we know that the sun was not created till day number 4. So, what did God create in day number 1? You guessed it, He created time. You see, our God is not bound by time and space. He lives in a far superior dimension than the one He has placed us in. And He placed us in this dimension of space and time for a purpose. We are His second family. As you know, there were members of His first family who rebelled against Him. And so God created man, and God created us in innocence. And He placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we know that the rebel from God's first family, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, tempted Eve and Adam, and when they sinned, they were put forth from the garden. Well, what we see later, we see Noah's flood, and then after the flood, there's the rebellion of Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And after the rebellion of the Tower of Babel, when mankind has completely rebelled against God, God says in Deuteronomy 32, 7 and 8, that he will call Jacob and make a nation, and that he will use that nation, the seed of Abraham, to reclaim the families of the earth from Genesis 10. So, what we have is the nation of Israel being used by God to reach out to a world who was lost in sin. And we know, other than Israel, that the entire Roman Empire at the time of Christ was steeped in paganism and the worship of false gods. So, interestingly enough, God's chosen people, when the Messiah came, who was promised, the religious leaders crucify Christ. However, some of the Jews believe, and they became the first members of the church. And so God did, in fact, use the nation of Israel to reclaim the nations when he started this thing that we call the church. There's an article in Prophecy Watchers by Pastor Gary Stearman on dispensationalism. And he defines dispensationalism as God's time management. And I mean, think about it. We all have time management in our lives. We get up. We have a time of preparation. We have a time of work. We have lunchtime. Praise God. Uh, we have a time at home. We have a time for church. 
Well, throughout this constraint that God has put on humanity, where the hourglass of time is running, at the end of time, only one of two things will happen to us. Either redemption or judgment. And God wants us, His church, born of the seed of Abraham, to reach out to a lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants us to tell them, it's time to trust Jesus as your Savior. It's time to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He loved you. He shed His blood for you on the cross of Calvary. He's the only acceptable sacrifice for your sin. And when you come to God as a sinner and you trust Him in your heart by faith, you will receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit and everlasting life. And you will become part of what God is doing in this segment of time management, which we call the church. You will become part of the church age uh, saints, and you will become part of His living body. And so, dispensationalism is God's time management. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. God talks about His time management. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. The Bible says this, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood. You see, we're saved on the basis of the sacrifice of His shed blood. The forgiveness of sins, our sins are forgiven, washed in that precious blood, according to the riches of His grace. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not by what you do, it's by who you trust, whom you have believed in. And then in verse 8 it says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now the mystery in the Bible isn't something mysterious. It's something that God has yet to reveal. And what has he yet to reveal? Well, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, not based upon us, but upon Himself, that in the dispensation of time, God's time management program, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Well, what is verse 10 talking about? It's talking about the end of the church Age. You see, the church began on a very specific day in history. It began on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached that wonderful sermon, and 3,000 people were saved. Likewise, the church age will end at a very definite and finite time. And we know that that is called the rapture of the church, where Jesus comes and takes his saints to be with Him in heaven. And during this time, this age of grace, this age of the Holy Spirit, we who have trusted in the shed blood of Jesus, we who are members of that precious organism, that living organism called the church, we are to reach out to a lost and dying world and give them hope in the cross work of Christ so that they too might trust Jesus as their very own Savior and be born again of His Holy Spirit. And so, the dispensation of the fullness of times, Jesus gathers together all those who have believed in Christ, that is, His church age disciples. What's interesting is that God specifically commissioned an individual to carry on and carry out His purpose and will for the dispensation of the church age. And many of you have already guessed, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. And so, I want to go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. There's also a few other scriptures which we could turn to. 
but I'll spare you this morning. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. The Bible says this regarding the dispensation of grace. And remember, God commissioned Paul, the apostle, to carry out his will during this church age. So, let me read this to you. The Bible says this, Paul said, For though I preach the gospel, that is that Jesus died, was buried, rose again the third day, that's the gospel. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You see, the Apostle Paul took seriously the commission from the Lord Jesus Christ to go into all the world and share that good news that other people might have the hope in Christ that we have, that others may come to know the forgiveness of sin and the promise of life everlasting in the presence of God. And he said, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but against my will, here it is, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And so there's a few other places where God specifically calls on the Apostle Paul to carry out his time management program, his dispensation of the church age, the age of grace, the age of the Holy Spirit. And as you all know, Paul in his missionary journeys went throughout the Roman Empire, starting churches in every city, churches in homes, and people were being saved, the Jews first and then the Gentiles. And here we have the birth pains of Christianity flourishing and proliferating throughout the kingdom in such a stage of growth as we have never seen since that time. It was committed unto the Apostle Paul. But there's something else interesting going on here. Remember we said God is not bound by time and space? He is in a dimension far superior than the one He has placed us in. And in God's dimension, remember He said as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways? Well, in God's dimension, He sees all of eternity laid out before Him at once. He knew you. He knew me. He knew how many hairs were on our head, how many speckles were on our face. Before the foundation of the world, He sees all things at once. And so, the Bible tells us clearly in Revelation chapter 17, that there is the Lamb's book of life which was written before the foundation of the world. So think about this. There is a book that God has with the names of every soul that ever lived. And those of us who are saved are in the Lamb's book of life. And one day when we get to glory, when Jesus takes us to be with Him, He'll open that book and He'll turn to the page and He'll turn to our name and He'll plainly show us Yes, you're here. Welcome in, thou good and faithful servant. What a blessed time that will be. But think about this. He has had that book on his shelf before the first day of creation. Isn't that amazing? We were in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. The Bible also says that it's based on God's foreknowledge. Just because our names are written in the book, God doesn't cause us or force us to be saved. He elect us or He chose us because of His foreknowledge. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So in other words, He knew that when we heard the gospel, we would trust Christ as our Savior and become His children. And so our names have been in that book of life before the foundation of the world. I want to read to you again Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 1, but verses 3 and 4 say this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, in heavenly places in Christ. 
Maybe you don't feel financially blessed. Maybe you're dealing with a difficulty. Maybe you're saddened uh, because you have to be quarantined because of the virus. But God has given you rich spiritual blessings. And now He wants you to realize those blessings by drawing close to Him. And then verse 4 says this, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. In other words, God knew before He created the earth that you and I would be His children. What an amazing thing. Imagine those of us who have had children. And my children are adults now. Now I have grandchildren. But imagine if we knew before we were even married, when we were just children, that one day we would have a blessed wife or a blessed husband, and who those children would be and what their names would be, and what they would be like growing up, and what their characteristics would be, and the fun and the faults that they would have, and all the memories that we would forge together. God knew us long before He created the earth as we know it. And so, what I'm trying to tell you is God knew us before time. Isn't that a wonderful thing? There's something else I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about our time. Today, the day in which we live. The day in which we are all secluded and concerned about this virus that is a pandemic sweeping our entire globe. Well, we've been preaching for quite a while now that we actually live in the end times. And we know that we are in the end times because in 1948, God gathered His nation Israel back to their land and to prepare them for the kingdom, the thousand year, literal, millennial reign of Jesus Christ on earth when He comes again with His saints and angels, that would be us, praise God. We know that now we live in the end times. But here's what the virus speaks to us about. That the world has changed. And the world can change drastically overnight. We need to understand that it's time to wake up and see what God's doing. Realize God's program. And just as the religious leaders crucified Christ, the religious leaders from God's own people Israel, they crucified the Messiah when He came and offered His kingdom. But the common people reached out to Him and believed on Him and became the first saints. And so we need to understand, as Jesus is about to come again to set up His kingdom, there won't be business as usual. Things will never be the same. You can't go through the repetition of the days of your life, day after day, without hardship. Today it's the coronavirus. It'll be something different in another time soon. But here's the bright spot in all of that. We have faith. We know that Jesus is in control and that He's our Savior. And we know that He's coming again because He promised. And so, what am I trying to challenge you with this morning? I'm trying to tell you that we need to look at this time as a time of opportunity. Not as a time of tragedy, but as a time of opportunity. And so, I've been preaching to you for many months on fasting and prayer. Maybe you can't be here with me today in church, but you're having church in your house. And I hope it's a blessed time for you and your family. And that as a family, you will draw close to Christ during this time of devotion. But I hope that personally and individually, each and every one of you who are members of our church family would draw close to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Let me explain to you again. God desires nothing from us but our faith. You see, it's all we have that He desires. You can't do anything for God, but He can do a multitude of things for you. And so, how do we build our faith? How do we become spiritual? Through prayer. 
And so I'm hoping you will take this time. Many of you are home from school and from work. I know you're home from church. You're having church in your house. Take time to pray. Draw close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Build up your relationship with Him. That's how you're spiritual. That's how you abide in Him. And then, when you sense His presence in your life, the most important thing is to activate your faith. To pray and build your faith, and then use that faith. Activate your faith. Trust Him through these troublesome times. Look to help other people. Look to be a blessing to your family. Look to serve God any way you can. Look to enhance your relationship with Him. Activate your faith and claim His promises. I want to read you just a brief scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. The Bible says this. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You see, that's the only event in all of human history that changes things. And when we realize that, that the cross was God's sign in the road, at the fork in the road, of the way we should take, of the path that we should endeavor to embrace. Seeing Jesus on the cross, by faith, trusting Him as Savior and Lord. I determine not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. There are many people who are filled with fear and trembling over the virus. But we have faith. We have conquered fear. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What's the mystery? The church. The Jew and Gentile would come together through a common faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we would form this thing called the church. This church age, this dispensation, that is a, an interruption in God's program with Israel where God is using the church to reclaim the nations to be His family, that He might abide with us forever. It says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. This is God's promise to the church. He said, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God has prepared for you and for me. He's prepared for us through these troublesome times. And He has prepared a place for you and I in eternity with Him. That He would be our God and we would be His people. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, He may be also. Isn't that a blessing? The Bible said that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. You see, our religion can't save us. Our good works can never erase our sin, and sin is what condemns us to hell for all eternity. And because the Lord loved us, Jesus died on that cross and He shed His blood, and the Bible makes a promise to us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Have you called on Jesus to be your Savior? Have you trusted Him by faith in your heart? Have you been born again of the Spirit? Have you received that free gift? It's only by faith in what He's done for you and not what you do for yourself. And if you are born again, if you have trusted Him like Nicodemus did, you are part of the church. You are part of this church age, this dispensation, and it is coming to a close, and God is working a great work, and He's preparing us for His kingdom. And so, God is starting to put a spark in each one of us here in our church family. And it's my prayer that God would fan the flames of that spark that He's placed within us, and that the Holy Spirit would well up inside us as a flaming fire, and that we would be witnesses unto Him here in these last days. And so I want to leave you with this. The Bible says, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What time is it? It's our time. What time is it? It's high time to wake up. What time is it? It's time today to trust Jesus as your Savior. Is it troublesome times? You bet. But timing is everything. And this is God's time to draw us close to Him. And this is God's time to encourage us to give hope to the world around us that is crumbling with fear and trembling through this tragedy. This is an opportunity. Seize the moment. Thank you for worshiping with me this morning. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen.